So, hello there, everyone. I guess it really doesn't take too much in the way of searching around to get the impression that much of our modern politics, much of our modern civil discussions, are sort of overrun and dominated by hardline, radical, crazy people. Whether we're talking about the left with the social justice warrior or the militant uh, Antifa sort of groups, or we're talking about the hard right with the sort of ethno-racial nationalist, or white power, or alternately alt-right types, or even just outside of that, if we're looking to matters of the more clerical with Islamist uh, crazies and militants, as well as a decreasing number of Christian nationalists and batshits like the Westboro Baptist Church, it's, well, it can be difficult to really see that moderate, reasonable center. Now, this being the case, I at least hope, but I believe, and I strongly believe, that the majority of the people within our given societies here in the West and really throughout the world, they're not really interested in hardline ideologies. They're not really interested in orthodox ways of thinking. At least not so far as that they believe that, you know, death to the non-believers or that purges or other sorts of madness, no platforming, these sorts of things, that most people really do hold to a notion of basic human rights, things such as free expression, things such as a right to life, uh, a right to live your life, um, a right to be free from a threat of violence from those who would affect it against you simply because you've either voiced your opinion or because you failed to support their cause. The, the myriad of what we could define as human rights are discussions and debates that really themselves could be quite enriching if we could simply have them, but they seem increasingly difficult to have, at least in public, thanks to so many of these hardline ideologues and, for lack of a better term, crazy people. Now, as it stands, our mutual friend, Sargon of the Cod, who's potentially one of the foremost, sort of at least, thought leaders in certain circles of ours, even though you may not always agree with him, and I know I don't, but this is a man with an audience and a fine mind. Now, he's been in the works, uh, he's been working on, rather, something of sort of a doctrine of principles for what I suppose we're tentatively calling the new skeptical movement. Now, itself is one which is based in reason, rationality, and sort of tries to harken back to the old enlightenment values and principles which so many groups and movements within our society seem to have abandoned. Now, I will hope to be working on this in terms of the wording itself, in terms of, you know, really drafting it out, in terms of doctrine of, of uh, statement of principles as it was. But at the same time, the question of effectively trying to launch a new rational, reasonable, humanist, rationalist, maybe empiricist ideology as it was, or at least just a, a doctrine of principles which encourages people to be more mindful of the questions that they're posed with and the ideas that they're presented with and the zeitgeists and ideologies that they're offered. What it will take to get these masses, these silent, potentially rational masses, to really entertain the notions of critically examining arguments that are made to them and to question things, not just authority, but to question established and broadly accepted ideals so as to better flesh them out and understand them altogether. I fear that it may take a sort of adoption of tactics and strategy from the more effective schools that have, despite their perhaps antisocial or uh, societally dangerous narratives, have been effective at sowing their ideologies within the fabric of our societies. Now, if we consider, for instance, the methods by which, let's go back a couple decades before we really launch into the modern ones, if we consider the methods by which let's say the evangelical Christian right 
with all of their oftentimes intolerant and theocratic dogma, was able to effectively push their agendas not only into the halls of power by way of supporting given parties, but also by way of affecting the way people speak and think. What comes to light is a great deal of tactics, which cannot be overlooked. And this feeds into today. Now, this comes by way of how they presented their arguments. And the ways that they presented their arguments typically were being that their thoughts and their ideas were such that they stood for family values. And you see this even now within their existing political campaigns and political activism. The invocation of family values and traditional values are constantly used as almost rhetorical devices, really. Because after all, I mean, who can argue with the fact that a family is an important thing outside of the reactionary social justice warrior? But we'll get there. But when it comes to that, for one to stand up and openly oppose the concept of family or values or even tradition, it can be a difficult and perilous thing in argument, largely due to the rhetorical devices which are built into the usage of such ideas and concepts as basis and justification for ideas. Now, skipping forward, we have ourselves the social justice warrior. And of course, they stand for equality, if you are to ask any of them. Now, if you are the type of person who stands for, or stands rather against equality, well, then you're clearly a bigot. And nobody wants to be a bigot. I mean, some people do. But by and large, the most rational, intelligent person, most of the masses, those who would like a better world, but are not necessarily adherents to orthodox ideologies, when they hear that the options posed to them are that you either support this movement for equality or you are against equality and you are a bigot, well, naturally, they're going to at least take a soft stance saying that they support equality. It isn't until perhaps they dig deeper into some of the more dogmatic rhetoric of some of the facets of social justice, such as like Black Lives Matter or intersectional feminism, which seems to claim that all white males who are cisgendered and heterosexual are themselves the devils and automatically imbued with racism and hatred for anyone that is not them, and they are themselves instruments of the oppression of other people. Most rational people, I would like to believe, would reject these sorts of concepts on their face as they're facile and imbecilic to begin with. But it is the dogma, the rhetoric, which allows them to propagate their narratives unchecked. And it is with the shrill shrieks with which they promote this idea that failure to abide by their various but generally specific versions of social justice makes one a hateful bigot, which either causes some to either entertain their notions until they can be indoctrinated using the often false academic materials provided, or alternately cowed into silence by not wishing to be labeled a bigot in the course of their arguing, that allows this to propagate and flourish. Likewise, it seems, in almost a marriage made in hell, this false sense of equality and bogus egalitarianism is also what seems to allow them to shield Islamists, who in their own societies have a very similar means by which propagating their ideology, that being backed up by violence in this case, but the violence notwithstanding, saying that it is itself God's will that those who are around them ought to follow what it is they believe. We are once again posed with the notion that when posed with an impossible rhetorical device such as God's will, how is one who lives in a faithful and, I dare say, in some cases, simple society to really rebuke that, to deny it? Absent deeper intellectual consideration on their own part, and then the crafting and formulating of rebuttal arguments, which themselves, if offered, can oftentimes fetch prison or death sentences, how is it that even one with lower levels of education, one who doesn't perhaps have the time as they have to work and struggle to survive, when presented with something which they are told is God's will, how are they to genuinely oppose that? Now, as I've examined all of these with you here over this last ten minutes, it's, it is, I believe, worth noting that in our attempts, perhaps, to advance a rational and intelligent and fact-based skeptical mentality 
within our given societies, if we are to court the masses who themselves would rather not get too mired in needless fights and would rather side with something which is just beneficial and egalitarian society-wide, what is the best method, the best tactic, the best strategy, would you say, to effecting change within their minds, given the opposition to things which have so very thoroughly established that opposition to them means that one is evil, rotten, and a sinner? Though I'm not here necessarily right now to propose to any of you or to anyone listening any defined notions of the best ways to go forward with this, I will say that consideration and discussion should begin about considering the manners in which such rhetorical and reductionist tactics are used to at least bring people into the fold and offer them the deeper meanings behind the rhetoric. Thankfully, when it comes to concepts of reason, skepticism, and objective critical inquiry, we do have, to a good extent, logic on our side. We have reality on our side. We, those of us who are devotees of the rational, skeptical, critical mindset when it comes to questions of either society or divinity, have on our side the advantage of being able to entertain ideas without necessarily adopting them. This is something that our adversaries in this case do not have. If one is to entertain notions of social justice, they are typically obligated by groupthink, zeitgeist, and peer pressure to adopt wholesale whatever the flavor of the month might be in respect to that social justice cause. Likewise, within religious movements, outside of those which may be reformed and more socially progressive in their thinking, especially when I respect to Islam. The opportunities to critically examine and flesh out the ideas by way of discussion are largely denied outright, sometimes under the threat of violence. We have neither violence nor necessarily peer pressure. In fact, in the inverse, we actually have a, a spirited encouragement of critical debate and opposition analysis, taking perhaps a position that you don't necessarily even hold, just to play devil's advocate so that you fully understand what it is that's under discussion. But throughout all of this, it still requires us to be able to reach out to the masses, those who may not made up their minds in the course of such, and encourage them to come and consider the ways of thinking which we commonly seem to hold dear. In this, I would like to then propose that it be considered that perhaps the adoption of rhetorical devices and political style, not necessarily dogmatic, but more rhetorical, sloganeering, campaigning, crusading, and branding, might very well end up being necessary in order to combat the mindless inanity we are faced with presently. If this should be the case, as... Revolting as it may feel to have to sink to the level of campaign sloganeering and propaganda, it may very well be worth the doing the soul-searching required to question the ends versus means notions here. And if this is the case, one has to ask that if by sloganeering and campaigning and even propagandizing on the concepts of the virtue of reason and critical inquiry are the ways in which more people can be encouraged to question the orthodoxies and zeitgeists which seem to increasingly dominate our conversations. Is it then in fact worth it to engage in such, even though it may lend itself to corruption and co-option? I suppose in this case the article that this video is attached to, which for those watching this video on my channel will find linked in the low bar, or the description rather, and for those watching while well, after reading the, arg the argument in the article presented, it's posed more as a question. If we as a movement of sorts, those of us who wish to defend reason and rational argument, those who wish to defend skepticism and critical inquiry, those who wish to stand for free speech in an almost absolute sense, and those of us who wish to question, criticize, and take down ideologies and movements which are harmful 
to individuals and societies as a whole simply for the self-righteous feelings of those involved. If we are to do this, to what level are we to adopt the functional and productive tactics employed by our adversaries in an effort to defeat them? So in this, I, I thank you for your time and your attention during this little ramble and, I suppose, philosophical curiosity of mine. I encourage you, as always, to um, click through and read some more of the rationalists here, works by Vernaculus, that guy T, Skeptor, Sargon, and myself, as well as come and check out my and our respective channels, if you haven't already. If you are on my channel, um especially for the first time, please do hit um, like, subscribe, leave a comment below. And if you enjoy this work and would like to see more of it, feel free to visit my Patreon. I do accept donations to keep it going. Short of that, though, thank you for your time, your rational mind, and I'll see you next time.